University of Science and Technology, Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the University of Science some picture on national policy for Meghalaya. Like, you know, we do a late he was the fourth. The country has always been throughout his academic career. He was awarded the prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial Fellowship. He was a research establishment, Oxford England. After completing the cutting, sir had joined Nehru, lecturer in physics in 1970. He's a new scientist by name. Hello, I, I can't hear. There's no sound coming. Uh, actually, due to some network issue, Hoxer is not being able to join us, but he will join us later. But I would now like to request Professor Khating, sir, uh, to please uh, give your memorable lecture on this auspicious occasion. Sir, over to you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You, uh, yes, sir. Yes. You are audible, yes. please, sir. Okay. Yes, okay. okay. Uh, because yes, sir. Yeah. Loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, Namaste and Greetings to all of you. Uh, I am so thankful to your honorable chancellor, you know, STMTM for, for giving me this opportunity and this honor of delivering the PA Sangma Memorial Lecture. And especially to be associated with such a, an outstanding personality as he, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, uh, you know, an honor for me. 
you know, because he he showed uh, through his life an example that with strong principles and a very focused goal that one can rise to any level no matter what small beginnings you might have started from so in a way he has set a high benchmark for all of us for USDM and all of us from the northeast in particular and using him in an example from his life we also can strive to emulate him and build for ourselves also the people who become stalwarts in their respective fields i what i read from the usdm uh, website was that he has been an ardent supporter of usdm and that's why the university has uh, endorsed the contribution by dedicating you know an, an eight story building as a pa sangma international block they have instituted a pa sangma chair professor for tribal studies they have also now have proposed a pa sangma international medical college and and hospitals so that's how the university is remembering him now he from the education point of view he has always acknowledged that it was through education and especially through the guidance and mentorship of a very very devoted and committed teacher that he could build himself up and come out of the remote surroundings that he was in he studied in shillong and debruga and he he mastered assamese language in fact and could give a, you know he could give speeches at rallies and very confidently he was filled filled with grace he was very witty he was patient and he had tremendous negotiation skills which were qualities that served him well especially as he held the post of the uh, speaker of lok sabha so for us also you know it is true education that we can understand the world around us and it is especially true the guidance and mentorship of good teachers that we can learn to relate to the circumstances and environment around us so as to grow in stature and in character being able to effectively utilize the knowledge that one has acquired the new education policy 2020 it aims to do just that if i quote from that it says a quality higher education must enable personal accomplishment and enlightenment constructive public engagement and productive contribution to society it must prepare students for more meaningful and satisfying lives and work roles and enable economic independence at the level of society the aim of higher education must be to enable the development of an enlightened socially conscious knowledgeable and skilled nation that can uplift its people and construct and implement robust solutions to its own problems this is what is written in the policy statement of the uh, national education policy 2020 the new education policy 2020 now the nep 2020 has is about 20 about 70 plus pages so i'm not going to go through all that but from from that what i'll try to do is you know just a few points about five six points which will which um, i understand as the, the gist or some uh, areas which might be particularly relevant to the universities around the region i'm picking only on those so there will be lots of points that one can debate and discuss on but i'm i'm picking only on a few points that um, i have understood from this nep 20 2020 the first one is that it underlines the importance of a liberal arts education approach a liberal arts education approach <clears throat> you know it says in the policy the very idea that all branches of creative human endeavor including mathematics science vocational subjects professional subjects and soft skills should be considered arts indeed has distinctly indian origins 
this notion of a knowledge of many arts or what is what in modern times is often called liberal arts <clears throat> that means a liberal notion of the arts must be brought back to indian education as it is exactly the kind of education that will be required for the 21st century now for us it what does it mean it would mean that our universities would perhaps need to go for a liberal arts education approach this is prevalent in many uh, western universities even in the west the undergraduate program is for about 4 years and generally the first 2 years uh, they are dedicated to what they call general education where irrespective of what honors or major a student might be interested in all students are taught a range of subjects from science to humanities so an, an, an aspiring science student would it be taught in as many as six or more subjects in humanities not just nowadays we teach only we perhaps only english one subject which is non science rest all science but there no as far as six subjects or more which are in humanities for a science major student now so and in these options the options can also include music and sports so if you look at our present three year ug program now perhaps the way if we are going to approach this is that perhaps in the first year that means two semesters we can offer maybe 10 different subjects five in each semester so if you go by credit system if each um, um subject offers four credits so five subjects will be 20 credits in a semester okay so five subjects which can range from psychology to 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 music to history to international studies to anything so for the first year first two semesters this all students undergraduate students will be exposed to all to any any number at least 10 subjects say they have a choice some some, some university might be able to offer many electives so they will choose perhaps 10 because you can fit in about that many per semester and only from the second year onwards that means third semester onwards they might branch to major okay so about the next uh, two three years i mean so this means a, a science students also will have a, had a good exposure to humanities so that he will hopefully have a better understanding of the relationship between science and society so this is this is where you have this approach of what you call a liberal arts education approach that's what the policy uh, you know is aiming for now the policy says that the education should be holistic in other words it says there will be no hard separation between arts and science between curricular and extracurricular between vocational and academic in order to ensure the unity and integrity of all knowledge and to eliminate harmful hierarchies among and silos between different areas of learning so there will be multidisciplinary and a holistic education across the sciences social sciences arts humanities and even sports for a multidisciplinary world a holistic and multidisciplinary education it would aim to develop all capacities of human beings intellectual aesthetic social physical emotional and moral in an integrated manner such a holistic education shall be in the long term the approach of all undergraduate programs including those in professional technical and vocational disciplines so this would mean for us then it means flexibility in the choice of subjects it's essentially then this would mean earning credits in any combination of subjects and not just the honors or major stream as of now we have the choice based credit system but it will become more strongly applied so here the key word is flexibility so there will be flexibility not just in the choice of subjects but there will be flexibility also in the duration 
of the and the structure of the, the degree program itself. The structure and length of the degree program will be adjustable. So that's what a new policy says. Okay, it, it says the undergraduate degree will be either of three or four years duration with multiple exit options within this period with appropriate certification. So you might have a certificate after say one year and if you complete two years, you get a diploma and we have three years and it's a degree. So this option will be there as per a new policy. Now, as per a new policy, the preferred duration is four year multidisciplinary bachelor's program. Because you say if it's four years, then you have better time for getting training in the multidisciplinary aspect of education. So that's what uh, they, but in within that four year also, it can lead to a degree with, um, with research aspect in it. So you can have, instead of um, in a particular year, you might, you, a person can earn, a person can earn, you know, credits even through research, not necessarily by attending classes. So there's, there'll be a flexibility. The, the higher education institutes, I mean, universities will have their flexibility to offer different designs of the master's degree. They can have a two year master's degree with the second year devoted just to research for those who have completed three years bachelor's. In case some have completed four years of bachelor, you can have just a one year master's degree program. And in case I've done a five-year integrated program, the BEMA integrated five-year program, then they can qualify to go straight to a PhD program. But one aspect this is the MPhil program will be discontinued. So what will happen here is then the scholars, the students will be able to, according to their, their, their desire, choose subjects almost at will from almost any institutions across the country and they'll build up credits. And they will, so they'll call what is called an ABC, an academic bank of credit that'll be established. This will digitally store the academic credits earned from various recognized universities. And it, when, when it's time for them to qualify to earn a, dip, a, dip, a certificate or a diploma or a degree accordingly, one go to that bank, the, what you call the academic bank of credits, and then you can, the university can confer a degree accordingly. Now, here, we, we, universities by and large are already multidisciplinary in nature. But here in the policy, they keep stressing on this word multidisciplinary approach to everything. And that's why they're, they're saying that even professional education will become an integral part of the overall higher education. There, what they're saying is standalone agricultural universities, legal universities, health science universities, technical universities, and standalone institutions in other fields shall aim to become multidisciplinary higher education institutes. And single stream higher education institutes will be phased out over time and will have to move to become vibrant multidisciplinary institutions or become part of a multidisciplinary university or higher education institute. So then this would mean that, you know, this is an opportunity for us in a way for universities, uh, the conventional universities which are already offering multidisciplinary uh, subjects and, and uh, uh, in options, Be, uh, that this is a time for us to approach perhaps the single stream higher education in institutes. For example, a management thing which is quite well known or even agriculture or, or tourism institute, we are, we are all single stream. In a way they can tie up because those institutes will necessarily need to look for, either they have to establish their own at their own cost, which means more increased costs for infrastructure, for faculty, for 
always do it, to make themselves more multidisciplinary in nature, or they, they join and you form a cluster. That is, the, that is what a policy is. Form a cluster and you, you join you join hands. So you collaborate. So this is an opportunity now to, to do that, to, to approach uh, the single stream um, institutes for collaboration. Another area that the, the um, this NEP stresses on is skill development and vocational education. This has been there even before, for the last 15, 20 years have been there. But now, uh, but what has not succeeded is, you know, the acceptance of the, the training or the, the, what you could say equivalent to credits that people who come from skill centers or vocational education centers, when they come out and they want to join the mainstream, somehow, universities have not been too ready to, to accept them and to recognize their credits or to recognize their certificates. But now this, this is going to, uh, the, the ministry itself is going to constitute a national committee for the integration of vocational education. And through that, right from the school level, at different stages, uh, somebody in the school level, for example, can go for vocational training in ITI or some vocation, and then through that, th those credits will be counted. That 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 student can go up from class seven to eight to nine upwards can to as higher classes, where that will be recognized as if they had attended school on a regular on a regular basis. Similarly, whatever they earn in that one can also account to the standards and account to duration that be also recognized and made equivalent to say a class 12 uh, pass out candidate and they'll be eligible to join say the mainstream universities. So this is what is also has been envisaged in new education policy. In addition to all this, just uh, you know, gathering of knowledge and acquiring of knowledge and, and the flexibility and be more holistic and said, what is most important that, that the education policy you know, stresses on is ethical and human values, ethical and human values. So as you say, the purpose of the educational system is to develop good human beings, capable of rational thought and action, possessing compassion and empathy, courage and resilience, scientific temper and creative imagination with sound ethical moorings and values. It aims at producing engaged, productive and contributing citizens for building an equitable, inclusive and plural society as envisaged by our constitution. <clears throat> so a student would need to be taught ethics and human and constitutional values. This, for example, like empathy, respect for others, cleanliness, courtesy, democratic spirit, spirit of service, scientific temper, liberty, responsibility, pluralism, equality, justice, all these, these values also need to be taught. So now, yes, they are being taught in many places, but now it need to be more structured in the way they are taught. It's not just exposure for a day or so going to you know, an underprivileged um, area and then you spend a day there. But now one might need to actually create a credit base, for example, three or four credit base program where this, this student will go and spend time in different areas with different environments. For example, the, the, the student can go and spend say about a month or so, three weeks to a month, in an orphanage, <coughs> helping to teach the children, helping to learn, learning themselves, you know, working with uh, physically challenged children in institutions that, that do that, uh, working in and uh, uh, these old age homes, working in, in with slum dwellers and such. You know, so they are, they are, one can go directly or one can go through NGOs also, but then the universities we need to perhaps have more structured way of exposing the, the, the students to this type of activities. Because it is through these 
that the students will get a better appreciation, perhaps greater empathy and more compassion for others by the actual living experience that they, they may gain by going there. And not, it might not necessarily be just for, for, for one, uh, say if we have three years program, then that's just for, for the first year. It can be the first year, second year, third year. So that they continuously get this, so that is imbibed in them and they feel that their sense of responsibility, a sense of ownership, sense of oneness with others around them, with different communities. Internships also are built into the policy. These are already there and most, even now presenting, but here they're going to stress on internships being introduced right from the undergraduate level from the first year itself, not necessarily from the, the final year, the sixth semester, but even from the first year for even a short time, just to go and observe something, how things work for about two, three weeks. That is itself something they learn. Then as you go to the second semester, they, they'll have got some experience, more confidence, and so on. As they go to by the sixth semester, maybe it might be a two months uh, summer, summer program to go and intern somewhere. So this type of internships also uh, will, will need to come in, in, into the play. So here then, you know, the, we, in, in, to summarize, as per the policy, it says that towards the attainment of such a holistic and multidisciplinary education, the flexible and innovative curricula of all higher education institutes shall include credit-based courses and projects in the areas of community engagement and service, environmental education, and value-based education. Value-based education will include the development of humanistic, ethical, constitutional, and universal values of truth. Values of truth, that's satya. Righteous conduct, that's dharma. Peace, that's shanti. Love, that's prem. Nonviolence, ahimsa, scientific temper, citizenship values, and also life skills. Lessons in seva service and participation in community service programs will be considered an integral part of a holistic education. In the policy, they, they talk about also mm -hmm. different structures of governance, and there will be what they call a higher education commission of India. Many of the present uh, authorities will merge into that and there'll be this which will take care of uh, overall overseeing uh, the functioning of the different higher education institutes in the country. So, so these give, uh, this is give some idea about what the, uh, the new education policy requires you know, for us to, to be aware of and how we can now start implementing and working towards. For some, it can be, it might take time. For others, it might be easier. You know, the, um, and that's why, you know, for the earlier we, we, we look at it and start working on them, the better for us. Now here, with respect to Meghalaya then, how, how what were the implications of the, this, uh, the, uh, this national, a new education uh, policy have for Meghalaya, especially what are the implications for the universities and the higher education institutes in Meghalaya. <laughs> so in Meghalaya, then you come down to our own state. You know, one, I'm just, uh, you know, here is, is more or less random in a sense about what we can do as one of the universities that's located in Meghalaya. One is, you know, we can perhaps try and coordinate and collaborate among ourselves, different higher education institutes. We know who's where and we start contacting them to share on resources. Share on resources by, it, that includes infrastructure, faculty, exchange of faculty, exchange of students. Because finally the students were in principle, in theory at least, can go anywhere. So here then, uh, why not then we work together? In, 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 in the West, and many places, they have what are known as consortiums. So different universities, different research organizations, they, they combine together and they say, okay, you might concentrate on this aspect, I'll concentrate on this aspect, but we share resources. When your faculty or your students want to learn on this area, then you can come here and get a training. And when we want to learn something, 
you can come there. So we, we, we share on, on resources because the things can be quite expensive, especially if you're talking of science, uh, scientific equipment, they can be tremendously expensive. So then uh, it's not easy to, to also establish such things. So that is what one way of sharing, you know, because credits can, will be, we, we also from now on work on recognizing, mutually recognizing uh, the credits from each, of, each uh, institute. As it is, is going to come, it become a law in a way. But so the earlier we do it to, uh, and talk to each other, the, the higher education institutes among ourselves, the better for us. You know, we, we have to complement each other, not, not compete with each other. Because finally, we're all for the same thing, to develop our children, you know, to become upright citizens, knowledgeable, and who can go out into the world, become leaders, and to be a, a, a great source of help and support to society at large. Then we can, you know, try and uh, by, by uh, reading a letter, doing a little research perhaps, try to find out more about what are our strengths within our own states or within our region. And then try and develop courses in those areas. Now the courses need, need be a long degree level, uh, one full year, uh, three year, uh, two year program. It can be just one semester also. But there are so many small, small areas where people will benefit a lot if they get uh, specific training in them. So I've just jotted a few, for example. Some, of course, as I said, can be uh, a few months, can be, be up to six months also, depending on how deep you want. But just to get some, some training in them also would be sufficient to, to empower the youth. I'm not talking of just youth, just our, our own undergraduate students, but even youth from anywhere who might, if you have a, a, a certificate course of two months, one month, three months, and it'll be open to them, but to empower them. Okay. So some can be, for example, IT based. You know, IT based will be like IT software, programming, mass uh, communication, particularly digital mode, mobile applications, digital games, digital marketing, digital commerce, digital communication, including teaching and training methodologies. Because now even for teaching with all this pandemic is gone, we have, most of us have been practically forced to go for online teaching, but many have not uh, been trained on proper uh, teaching uh, using digital mode. So these also require training and teaching. Then cybercrime and security is all digital based uh, areas. Then for Megala, Megala is known as a tourist destination from across the country and even from across the world. So areas like hospitality, wellness, training as tourist guides, as tour operators, transport, ecotourism, adventure tourism. So these are things that can, uh, we can, one can train on and because we know or we can learn even more about which areas are good. For example, for adventure tourism, you know, we, we know about uh, lots of tourist spots in, in Megala. There's a common one. But Megala has nine out of 10 longest limestone caves in India, including one among the top 10 caving sites in the world. Megala has also the longest sandstone cave in the world. So, so these are things which are not so known, but they, they're there. And we as, as teachers, as resource persons, if we, we read and then train people on how to go about, how to coordinate, how to, you know, on these areas, that'll be a tremendous help to different groups of people across the range. Then we, 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 we work or train on, on uh, tradition and culture, because that is where we're rich in. Tradition and culture of the entire North is so rich, and so varied and diverse and very rich. It, it can be folklore and music, See, even in contemporary music, Shillong is considered the, the rock capital of India. Then we teach on tribal and customary law, traditional health. You know, they, I, I don't know how many might, might be aware, but traditional healers, we call them loosely as Kobiraj, but officially they are called traditional community healthcare providers, TCHPs. They are now being evaluated and accredited by QCI, the Quality Council of India. Quality Council of India is the, the top body in the country that, that gives uh, you know, the, all your BIS, 
SISI earlier. They are the ones for your hospital management, and NABH, NBL for laboratories, accreditation for the Quality Council of India is the overseeing body. They have formed a scheme about five years ago where they actually can evaluate and then recognize and accredit a traditional healer. So that and that goes by now is recognized. They already now in 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 the northeast, there about um, ninety of them have been so accredited, and they recognize they they are on the website of the Quality Council. You know, these these people from from Assam, from Tripura, from Nagaland, they're there. Some of them, they're there on the website of Quality Council of India, and across the world they know who who are these persons, the contacts that they are good in bone setting in jaundice and poisonous bites, so different types of things, they already known. And they've been qualified and certified under ISO 17024. So it's an international accreditation that they've got, even traditional healers to that extent. And their USTM also can play a role in trying to get them certified. Then there are strengths in Megala again, includes biodiversity and ecology-based areas. This includes, of course, your plants, your horticulture, floriculture, forestry, veterinary agriculture, aromatic medicinal plants, packaging and food processing, value addition. Then, in, then there can be modern uh, techniques of farming, including soilless farming. In a way, you don't use soil, you just uh, it can be what you call hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics. These are all these are modern things. And you can have a small kitchen garden, just a terrace base or large half an acre, one acre, 10 acres type of uh, area also. So these are things, but these are the, the more recent techniques and they are now catching up in the rest of the country. We will do well if we also get you know, involved in these areas. Then we also have heard about the Act East policy. So in the Act East policy, uh, yes, we, 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 we make lies touching Bangladesh, you're sitting on top of Bangladesh. So, it has one foreign country next to it. But the rest of Northeast, as I including Meghalaya in a way, indirectly, we are covered by other, other um, um, foreign countries with China, with, uh, with uh, Bhutan, with um, Myanmar, all these are around us. And then the, the, the Asian highway is already going through, through Assam, to Meghalaya, to Nagaland, to Manipur, all the way to to Myanmar, to Thailand, and across to the Far East, Southeast Asia, they're already there. And the Act East policy, uh, once it comes into, into play, you know, we need to be prepared for that. So we need to train, our universities should train people and be prepared them for them. And as people will just use us, you know, as a stepping stone and we'll just be swept through. People uh, from uh, perhaps from mainland India, they'll come and that's it. We'll be just a, a, a canal through which uh, things go up and down, but what benefit will we get unless we prepare ourselves for that? So these are areas where uh, we can also, you know, think of that. Because one of the subjects perhaps is, uh, where people say it's obvious, but still I'm just mentioning international relations. But international relations to me is not just, you know, a, a, a subject in, in political science. International relations, you look at it, is actually relations at an international level. So in relations mean what? All tribes, it can be commerce and trade, it can be culture and traditions, it can be handicrafts, cuisine, languages, communication, tourism, hospital, and all these come together through the study of international relationships. So this is what, um, you know, so, so now then, you know, our own you know, USTM itself perhaps can take an initiative in some of these areas, looking at the new education policy, because the Shillong was the academic capital of the Northeast, and it can still become one. So with, we have so many competent institutions and universities established in Meghala. So with that, the, the, the state can certainly become an educational destination of the country and the world, even now. Yes, with information technology, there are no physical boundaries. But then when you talk of holistic development, holistic education, we're talking of morals and, and ethical values and such, 
you do need contact mode of training. And Meghalaya offers wonderful climate conditions. You know, Meghalaya offers uh, the, the wide network of roads. Also, you can reach anywhere so fast and easily for, for also, not just for trade, but even if uh, a, a scholar, someone's come here and explore the area. So you'll have a great outdoor life. The indoor in-house training that he can experience here also will help the students not only learn, but more importantly, as per NEP 2020, learn how to learn effectively. So I would suggest, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, offer to, to suggest that USTM can take early steps in implementing the NEP 2020. It can play a leading role in promoting socioeconomic development of Megala and the entire Northeast. It has already built a very good record for itself. It should now assist in mentoring other institutions. The NEP 2020 provides the means and the flexibility to do it. It provides the authority also to do it. So these are just some of my thoughts for, on this and uh, how it can be related and uh, in applied to Megala and especially how USTM can play a, a major role in this area. So I wish the students, faculty and staff all the very best. I thank the Honorable Chancellor and wish him good health and greater success in all that he endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir. Uh, like, you know, it was a pleasure hearing you. I would now like to request um, Shri Mahabubul Hawk, sir, Honorable Chancellor, USTM, to kindly speak on the occasion, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening to all uh, uh, participants, my colleague. Uh, I am extremely sorry when I have reached home that uh, there was a wind and I could not connect because of internet problems. So I could not receive uh, Professor Hutting sir on this occasion. Uh, but uh, I am fortunate that uh, I could listen your entire deliberation. And uh, it was uh, very thought provoking and many unknown things. Although I am working from last 19 years in Meghalaya, but uh, I was unaware of many uh, things you have explored and certainly uh, to mm -hmm. come up with all such kind of initiative, we need your support and kind of uh, uh, association. And I am very happy today that uh, you are looking very uh, amazing and healthy in this pandemic. Uh, and uh, you are a very resourceful man. And uh, from the very beginning of our uh, endeavors, uh, starting from Regional College of Higher Education and then REST, mm -hmm. You are one of the spirit behind in growing our institutions. And uh, finally, uh, you have left Meghalaya and joined the uh, Central University of Jharkhand, where you have uh, founded the institution in a very uh, well-organized manner. Sir, your academic contribution is immense. It is known to everyone. And uh, we feel proud that uh, we could give the honor to you in one of our convocation offering uh, DSC to you. Uh, it is just a kind of uh, association. We are very much hopeful in the coming days. Uh, I thought many times to meet you personally in Shillong and getting different ideas. USTM is one of the, I must say, a very fertile land where we can explore many avenues and especially for the state of Meghalaya. We have done many things, but uh, we have a goal, uh, we have an objective, we have a vision to make the university one of the uh, global standard university and to compete with the universities of excellence. And uh, you have given many ideas and it is related to uh, new education policy. Certainly we'll take the lead. We have already organized many such kind of occasions where we have invited all the vice chancellors, academicians, and we have organized many brainstorming sessions. Today's occasion is a very special. We are very grateful the entire USTM family express our heartfelt gratitude that you have given the second PS Sangma Memorial Lecture and on a very relevant topic, the new education policy 2020 and thoughts of Meghalaya. You have given, we have noted all these things. Your lecture has been recorded and uh, we'll try to implement word by word 
and uh, certainly we'll be meeting very soon so that your whatever the idea you have and your experience which is very costly and expensive that mm -hmm. you have uh, during your uh, research period as an academician as an academic administrator and all such kind of experience uh, you have so USTM needs such kind of uh, advice and personality in our future endeavors uh, you are all knowing you have uh, mentioned that uh, how PA Sangma is uh, uh, relevant in academic endeavor of USTM that uh, the first meeting we uh, we have organized in Shillong where he was the person behind in connecting chief minister, governor and all other uh, officers and he was just smiling and encouraging us and then uh, these people and especially when they, he came to know about our initiative in Gohati, how we have been running the educational institutions, he assured us that all possible help. And within a short span, we got the enactment from the Meghalaya Assembly, and he was the main person behind. It is for our satisfaction and for his remembrance, we are doing uh, small, small uh, activities. Uh, already you have mentioned that we have a chair professor, who we could not uh, contribute too much, but we are searching a person where uh, this chair for professor can lead and do the uh, activities in related to the tribal affairs. Similarly, we are coming up with a very uh, nice academic block we have given a dedicate in the name of PS Sangma. So this is something uh, we always uh, remember and we always ex express of our gratitude to the people who are contributing in our journey. And PS Sangma is one of the further figures uh, in USTM journey you are knowing. And uh, although he, uh, he left uh, from this art, but uh, we USTM family always remember, always talks about, and uh, I personally feel proud that today, one of the dynamic chief minister of Northeastern states, everyone must mention is his Conrad uh, Sangma, who is leading the state very uh, nicely and uh, he's also extending his support to our uh, all such kind of endeavors of USTM. So I am looking forward to meet you again soon, sir. And we need your support and association so that whatever you have advised in this uh, memorial lecture, certainly we'll try to implement. And we want to explore uh, USTM uh, is one of the best university, at least in this region by 2025 and one of the best university globally by 2030. So these are our milestones, but without the support of the person like you, it is impossible for us. Mm -hmm. So please uh, uh, give your blessings, give your advice in all our future endeavors. And thank you very much, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, I'm very much, happy sir. that you are very uh, looking healthy, sir. <laughs> yes, long water. <laughs> uh, convey my regards to Madam also. I'll do that. Certainly, she'll be so happy. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, uh, we are coming to the end of today's program, okay. and uh, we are really honored that on this occasion, where like you know we have Professor Naling Khatong Khating sir, who is as I have already said the first Vice Chancellor of a Central University, the Central, uh, Central University of Jharkhand. He is the first person to and from the Northeast uh, region to be appointed as a vice chancellor of a central university located outside the Northeast. He is a great scientist, a great physician, uh, a, 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 a very learned person and a very dear person to us, a mentor who has always been guiding. To, uh, today, it is our honor because he has given his acceptance to give the memorial lecture today on the occasion of the P.S. Sangma Memorial Lecture. We know P.S. Sangma sir has been a very important integral part as Hoxar has said in the in the uh, like building and the creation of University of Science and Technology Meghalaya. Sir, we thank you from the core of our heart. Please, our gratitude and we hope to see you soon in our campus. We would like to extend our gratitude to our honorable chancellor sir, whose brainchild is the uh, memorial lecture and in a very short span of time, we had tried to arrange it and we hope uh, that sir, you'll always be guiding us, mentoring us. I would like to thank all the faculty members, all the participants uh, to, uh, who have joined today. And we hope that the, the words of Cutting Sir 
we shall be carrying forward what he has said we shall implement and put it into action thank you so much faculty members and the participants with this we would like to end today's program i'm thankful to the whole university fraternity and the whole uh, like uh, USTM rist and ERD foundation for this memorial giving us the opportunity to host this memorial lecture thank you so much sir and cutting sir we will see you very soon in our campus thank you thank you thank you so with this we live today thank you sir good day sir good day bye 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 sir